Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Talking Tax. More specifically, this is Talking Tax with Tom, Tom Yamachika, President of Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Today, we're going to talk about the love-hate relationship with P3. So that's public-private partnerships, PPP. And, and <laughs> more specifically, we're going to talk about public-private partnerships and how they work in Hawaii and whether they're really desirable or not. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thanks for having me on the show, Jay. So what is this thing with the love-hate relationship? What do you love about it? And what do you hate about it? Well, uh, it's not me. It's uh, our state government. Uh, part of being a PPP is that there's a public involved, right? P the first P is public. And, you know, the government has to play ball in order for it to work. So we, what we're going to do today is kind of talk about some recent examples uh, and see if they're working or not and and try to kind of come up with you know what's not working and why and uh, what can we do about it? Well, let's first let's uh, have a, a robust definition of a PPP. What is it? How is it structured? you know where does it fit? What does it do operationally? Well, a PPP uh, public private partnership is where, private interests and government interests combine to do a particular project. Uh, the most recent example of this is our iconic Aloha Stadium, uh, which uh, has been um, up for redevelopment because, you know, the current stadium is getting a little old. It was, it was kind of built in the, what is it, the 60s, right? Yeah. Did you and, say iconic? Uh, I thought you might have said sardonic. Um, I think you, you, you might have said pathetic um, or um, ironic. Ironic, that's what you must have said. Not ironic at all. It's, it's, it's rustonic. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's, that's one, been one of the big problems with it. But, but anyway, uh, the current plan, or at least it was current until a few weeks ago, uh, was to have a public-private partnership develop the stadium into a new Aloha Stadium Entertainment District, or NASED. Uh, you may have seen that abbreviation in the news uh, a lot. And the idea was for a private developer to come in and in, in exchange for, you know, fronting some of the cash, would get the rights to develop like residential towers, shops, and so forth around the new stadium. Uh, and that would be their part. And of course, the state would have its part in constructing the stadium and, and making sure it's available for such things as UH football games, uh, swap meets, or whatever the heck they want, to, they want to use it for. So let me, let me stop you there then. So each one has certain duties and obligations and benefits under an agreement of some kind. Let's call it a partnership agreement. Um, so the state has certain things it has to do, like, you know, money mostly, and permissions. And I suppose um, that gets around, um, you know, the procurement aspect. Um, how does the procurement aspect work, I, I want to ask you. And, and the developer, he gets uh, what could be a really a tremendous benefit. If he's a sharp negotiator, he's going to be rich. Am I right? Well, we don't know. Um in terms of how it works, uh, you you asked you just asked me that question. Uh, it typically goes through a, an RFP process, a re request for proposal. So uh, the uh, the stadium authority would go out to the community and say, "Okay, who's in, who's interested in doing this? Give me your best shot um, for what you plan to do, how you plan to do it, and what's it going to cost us, the state." Okay, let me let me uh, interrupt again. So um, it seems to me that when you negotiate a deal like that, uh, your first offer is really not what you wind up with. I guess I'm talking about a private-private partnership. Um, you know, I make an offer, a, a term sheet, if you will, and the other guy comes back with a different version of that. And we sit in a conference room for hours or days or weeks. We go back and forth. Um, and the ultimate uh, agreement is way different than what the original proposal was. So, you know, I have a, a problem with seeing this as an RFP um, because actually the terms of this re relationship, the public-private partnership document 
term sheet are going to be way different. So it's not like anybody can come in and give you that term sheet on an RFP response, right? Well, I mean, that's not how uh, the, uh, the the state apparently is looking at it. I mean, they, they look at it as, all right, uh, various proposals come in. We're going to score them, right, based on certain criteria, uh, which which are then made public. Um, the maybe, maybe 10 bidders come in. We, we knock out eight. We, we talk further with the remaining two. Give me your best and final offer um, and address this and don't address that. And you know, you know, stuff like that. And, um, uh, and then you get to a deal with the state on what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. Now, uh, with Aloha Stadium in particular, um, it's, it's been kind be kind of funny because what, uh, what the, uh, what the stadium did was they first went out uh, and purchase the services of consultants, maybe like $20 million worth of consultants and planners to come up with a, uh, you know, either a concept or a, a, a rough plan for how the land's going to be used. And presumably the state would put that into its RFP. You know, so, I, I feel that I've said this before, Tom, and, you know, it's, it's you, but it may be others. I am sure that if if you put us together, you and me, in a room uh, and uh, asked us to consult on this, we could do it for no more than $15 million. What do you think? <laughs> well, of course. Um, but they, they do come out with work product, with uh, conceptual drawings. They do, they do go to the community. They have these uh, public meetings and so forth around IAEA, which is, where this, which is obviously where the stadium is. And they... Uh, solicit community input, you know, go back and, you know, edit, refine, whatever, based on the community input. And they come up with something, you know, relatively final that they then go out uh, for an RFP with. Now, uh, the problem with uh, this stadium, with Aloha Stadium, is that the governor cut the process short. Because, if, uh, as you probably heard in the news a couple of weeks ago, um, the you know the project was with the Department of Accounting and General Services to solicit bids on, and the governor said stop. And the uh, the state comptroller Kurt Otaguro said stop. And governor said yep stop. We are taking this project in a different direction, and further announcements will be made by Mike Mike McCartney, who's head of DBED. We're we're going to switch the agency. And of course, the, the, the DAGs folks are, are, are saying, geez, I hope, they, I hope they wouldn't do that because we have, you know, uh, contacts, we have experience, we have, um, you know, a lot of relationships that have been built up over the, you know, the past two, three years, uh, you know, amongst the $20 million. Um, and, we, and we're obligated for the $20 million, right? They paid it. Well, it's out, what, a it's waste out the of, door. what a waste of money that is. I mean, presumably you wouldn't be starting from scratch, but where would you be starting from? That's that's the question. I mean, how are they taking this in a different direction? We don't know. And um, that's, I, I think, one of the one of the big risks that that you have in in any public private partnership of significant size, and that is, is somebody going to come along later on in the game? And pull out the rug. Uh, that's actually what I was thinking about. I wanted to talk with you about, but let's let's take the stadium first. Um, you have you have a, a crisis of confidence by the business community uh, against the government. You know what happened here. So my first question to you is, what happened here? What is the change of policy based on? And and what what they tell us is that the real reason, or is it some subterranean political reason? Uh, what are your thoughts? What's what's been in the press about the reason for this change? Uh, I've already said it. The governor said he wants to take the project in a different direction. What that means, I don't know. Um, is, is the governor but, some kind of expert in in the land use planning? Well, of course not. But he's the governor. Okay, I think I got my answer. Um, yep. But the the point to make 
here is that it's and I you know I a governor to, so by the way with with perhaps one or two months left in his term. Right, right. It's so strange. I hope somebody ultimately finds out what went on here because it's it is certainly not what it seems to be. And taking a different direction doesn't satisfy me. And it certainly doesn't repay the loss of $20 million of our money. Um, but, you know, the other thing I wanted to mention, and I think this, this pervades the whole concept, is dealing with government is different. You know, you deal with a, a, a private partner, and, you know, the, you got the courts, you got the law, you got you know, stare decisis and the rule of law, and uh, it can't be all that political because some judge may have to decide on a on a controversy or an arbitrator. Um, but when you deal with the government, it's different. The government has built in, uh, I don't know if you've ever run across this, built in statements in the law that says it can change its mind um, with impunity and uh, can break a lease with impunity. It can break a contract and it does break contract. So, you know, you have a completely unpredictable partner is what you have. Maybe subject to very strange and subterranean political influences. Um, and that is really not as attractive as dealing with somebody that you can vet, that you can research, that you can determine, you know, the litigation background for, um, that, that, and that you can sue if he goes south. So, um, you know, I, I just want to lay that out as a foundational point in my thinking, is that dealing with the government is dealing with an unreliable partner. Sorry. Well, I mean, that, that has been played out in history. Um, there are other instances where, you know, our state government has worked with private developers and, uh, and has gotten some questionable results. Uh, you may remember back in 1998, uh, we had the Hawaii Community Development Authority, which, of course, is trying to redevelop Kaka'ako. And they selected a plan by uh, Republican D.G. Anderson, uh, Andy Anderson, uh, for an entertainment complex. Uh, you know, they're in Kakaku, including a Ferris wheel, laser light tower, concert shell, shops, restaurants, and a mini golf course. Um, but the HCDA staff was hostile. The governor, Ben Cayetano at the time, he was hostile to it. Uh, when they were trying to negotiate the details, uh, and ultimately uh, the HCDA board uh, lost confidence in the financial projections, or that's what they said, and, and they basically scuttled the deal. That's one or two. Yeah. Of course, Ander Anderson complained that his plan was solid and, and was scuttled for political reasons. We don't, we don't really know what the truth is, but... Mm -hmm. um, the truth lies probably somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. HCDA came back again uh, in 2005 and selected a $650 million proposal from Alexander and Baldwin to, de to develop uh, you know, uh, 37 acres of land in Kakaako. They were thinking about condominium towers, restaurants, stores, a hula amphitheater, a waterfront promenade, and other, and other things. There, the 2006 legislature passed a bill to prohibit any residential use in the area, basically making the deal impossible. You know, I remember so well that uh, I got a call from the then CEO of A&B one afternoon on Wednesday, and he said he wanted to come down to Think Tech Hawaii, then on radio on KHPR. And uh, he, had, he had an announcement he wanted to make. Um, and um, sure, come on down. He came down and he announced it was our big scoop. He said they were pulling the plug on that deal because it was unworkable and they had had these issues. That was announced on Think Tech, Tom. So you're, you're really hitting one that reminds me of our past. Very good. Yep, no think tech has been instrumental in, in, in our history. And here's here's another one. Maui Memorial Medical Center. Uh, when it was run by the state, it was it was bleeding like crazy. Uh, not not blood, not actual blood, uh, but uh, you know, red ink. 
in the in, in accounting parlance. Uh, the state decided um, to go out and and get a private contractor to run it. Kaiser Permanente was selected and is running it. Lawsuits abounded, but apparently um, the uh, the you know, the legal kerfuffle cleared up and Kaiser is still running it. And, and I think they're doing a better job than the state did. Well, is that is that the uh, you know the fundamental conclusion we're moving toward here? That if a private company can do the job without um, you know having this um, love hate partnership with the state, it works out better generally. Is that the conclusion? Well, I think the issues are for pretty much the same uh, as you know the argument about you know privatization of government services generally. Are we willing to let some Joe Schmo profit from a good or service that government is or was providing? Are we willing to let those jobs? be staffed by folks who are not in our powerful government unions? Would it be justifiable if, if Mr. Schmo can provide the goods or services more efficiently? Would it be justifiable if Mr. Schmo can provide those goods at, or services at lower cost to the taxpayers without an appreciable reduction in quality? Would so it be justifiable? Then, go ahead. I don't, I don't want to stop you. Go ahead. <laughs> and would it be justifiable if the vendor is as transparent and accountable to the general public, namely us taxpayers, as the government agency is or was. So, go so ahead. if I'm a private developer and I want to do a project, why would I enter into a deal with the government? It's, all, it's unpredictable, sometimes completely wrongheaded, um, and I have all these burdens and possible losses down the road ahead of me. Um, why do I need to do it with the government? What is the government, you know, what, what is the way to pay, to open the path for me to do it by myself? And I would suggest an answer to you is that it probably helps you ingratiate yourself to the powers that be in the government and get favors from them and avoid at least some of the red tape and the permitting delays. And if I can get into a partnership with them, I'm, I'm better off in that aspect of the partnership with the government. Am I right about that? And if well, not, I would think I would think um, that if you are a developer who already has that goodwill built up, you already have those chits, then I think it's much less risky for you to go into the, the public private partnership in the first place and and you stand to you know make some good money. And that's why you would want to go into it. That's that's my take on it. Well, how would you change the system here to get the best of both worlds? You know, um, that's that's a very very good question. I mean, I think um, to get the best out of government in terms of you know efficiency services uh, benefit to the people you have to be willing to look outside the box okay um, you have to be willing to consider you know alternative forms of procurement of which PPP is one and if you can you know if you can strike a deal uh, where everybody you know benefits, and and I think Maui Memorial is one such deal. Um, then you then everybody's better off. You haven't really answered my question about the negotiation of the deal in the first place. I come in with a term sheet, and uh, they accept that because they they like that uh, for their RFP. Um, but then the, the deal that emerges is completely different. Seems unfair to the other guy who might have come in with a term sheet that's closer, you know, to the ultimate result that I get. Yeah, so, and, I, and he, I think I think if if that were to happen, if the deal were to 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 get um, changed you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 very much differently from you know from the original RFP. 
I, I think you know some court would force the government to go out for another RFP to go back to the beginning. Yeah, that that's uh, that's another element that we should throw in the in the fire. You talk about the Maui uh, hospital, and you know they had wrinkles, they had disputes, they had controversies and lawsuits and what have you. And it seems to me that the possibility of controversies and disputes and lawsuits are is much greater when you're dealing with a public-private partnership. Not only because the government uh, is not completely reliable, but because um, there's an invidious comparison out there by others who, you know, are are resentful that they didn't get it, uh, and they want to attack it, and they they try to find ways that the law relating to the establishment of public-private partnership has not been fully complied with. And so you have litigation. And I, I would ask you, you know, is the possibility of litigation greater uh, in the establishment, you know, and the, the stabilization, if you will, of a public-private partnership than the development of an ordinary partnership? No, well, I would imagine it would be um, because there are more variables. Um, it, it's, it's, it's tougher to convince you know, a court when you have more degrees of freedom, uh, that what you've done is is fair in process and followed the uh, the letter of the procurement code. Um, I mean, the, the the simplest case is is you is you go up for procurement. Um, you know, the government specifies a you know a good a, a good that they want to buy, and everybody comes in and the government selects the lowest price, right? Easy. Um, no degrees of freedom, just the price. When, when, you, when you kind of uh, go out toward, all right, you know, give me the best product that does this. There, there are more degrees of freedom because you know, people come in with different models, different types of things. And so you're looking not only at price, but quality. Then you get to things like the public, the public private partnership where, where you have, okay, we have this land, we're going to, you know, this is what we want to do. Come give us a proposal where, you know, you can develop X, Y, and Z, but we got to make money too. So, so they're, they're all, the universe of solutions uh, is multidimensional, right? Because there, there are many criteria uh, and, and, you, and then, so, the, the losing the losing bidders, if any, would have to come, uh, and, and and that's one of the catch catches. By the way, it, are are is there more than one bidder? Sometimes there's not. Okay, um, but if there's a losing bidder, then yeah, the fact that you have all these degrees of freedom can um, give an opening to challenge the uh, the bid process in court, and and the agency has to come back and saying, well. Uh, we had we had a bid committee that uh, that looked at these criteria. Uh, you know, here here's who the committee members were. Here's how they scored each uh, each proposal. Here are the score sheets, and uh, this is why we went with uh, this bidder because the score was X, as opposed to the second bidder whose score was X minus fifty, and so on. You know what? Those score sheets can be manipulated too. We, we both have seen that. But let me, you know, let me ask you this, though. The decisions you that mean are like made... The, like the referendums in Donetsk? <laughs> something. Okay. Good comparison. One other factor in play here is that, you know, you, you talk as if the level of sophistication of analysis is equal, but it's not. If I'm a developer, I have, I have a room full of very sharp pencils. Uh, that are able to make close decisions on how this project should go. If I'm the government, I don't have that. And I make mistakes. And I have um, people who are assigned to look at the project and uh, opine on it, engage on it. They, they may not know which end is up, uh, including the lawyers who, don't, who haven't written a partnership agreement like this. So, um, you know, I think the problem is that the government compensates for that by sometimes being very aggressive without being incisive. And then you get a very skewed result. So it's hard to negotiate with someone 
who is in that spot, who doesn't know, who can't see exactly what you're aiming for, who, who gets paranoid about, um, you know, that you're going to make too much money and he's going to make too little money. Uh, hard to negotiate a deal like that. And it winds up as an imperfect arrangement that ultimately they find they can't live with. Haven't you seen that? Well, of course. I mean, there there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of considerations as to why, uh, you know, governments may may want to, like, uh, you know, scuttle a, a uh, prospective deal with a with a, a public partner. I mean, a private partner. Uh, one is the perception that the private partner is making off like a bandit, right? Which is the the concern that you've addressed. Um, but you know there there are uh, countervailing considerations. Like you got you got to you got to realize that the uh, the private partner is taking a lot of risk for the reasons we've outlined. Well, yeah, I and I you know I tilt on that side of it. He he is taking a lot of risk, and we have to be you know sympathetic with that end of it. But you know I want to go to another point. Um, we have a few minutes left, Tom, and that is this. Hawaii seems to have a problem. I don't know if it's uh, unique on this in large projects. We have a problem in building the convention center. We certainly had a problem, and we still have a problem in in building Kaka'ako. Nobody can say that Kaka'ako is a success, you know. Um, and there are and then there's rail. And then there's rail. Exactly. And then the stadium, as you mentioned, um, we we always seem to get klutzy when it, when it comes to these big projects. As a result, we, we really don't do well in building them. And we can't build them as much, perhaps, as we should be building them. Uh, I think we are in our own special sui generis category on that. Uh, and, and it has to do with bureaucracy. It has to do with politics. It has to be uh, what school you went, you know, kind of thing. And, and um, I'm, I'm worried about that. And I wonder if you can see a way um, that we can, you know, develop either public-private partnerships or some other system to encourage, uh, you know, uh, competent, honest developers to big build, pro big build, to build big projects without getting stuck and without the public getting stuck. And with the pro with the project is actually well conceived, uh, necessary for the community development, um, and um, successful. Uh, we, we don't have that experience, and I wonder what we need to do to get there. Well, I think one reason why we've we've got the uh, experience that we have been is the you know the shroud of secrecy surrounding you know projects like those. Um, the government usually is not forthcoming with details. Uh, you know who the bidders are, what the bids were, what the bids said. Uh, I, I think over the years that's gotten better. But I think it really needs to to get better and better, uh, to at least let the rest of us who uh, have to pay for this, you know, you, you know, Joe Blow taxpayer like me, uh, we we need to kind of figure out what went on, and uh, you know, is there a real problem? Is if there's not, then what we you know what we can what we can do to fix it. Um, or have we just kind of made a mistake in the in the in you know going out for bid at all? Yeah, seems to me that um, the procurement act needs needs to be reformed, and there has to be something in it or with it uh, to uh, allow for better process on building big projects. Um, the public, yes, I totally agree with you. The public has to be informed, uh, so there aren't a lot of secrets. And ultimately, you know, ultimately, Tom, it's the lawyers. The lawyers have to make a, a, an agreement that is resilient against the change of administration, coming or going. We can't have a, a dramatic $20 million shift for no stated reason uh, two months from the end of the term of the governor. We can't have that. And, and the uh, private side of that partnership has to be able to rely on what the government has promised. And so those agreements have to be better drafted and they have to stick, you know, through thick and thin. 
um, and of course, through the changes of political administration. Do you agree? Oh yeah. Um, one of the, and as as we've seen, you know, uh, some of these big projects uh, have have gotten killed midstream. You know, and and no, you know, no contractor worth his or her salt who's, you know, going to be you know, putting in lots of free effort, uh, you know, to, to bid on this stuff, um, uh, wants to be faced with that. If they, you know, if they win, uh, they, they commit all kinds of resources to it and then find that, that the rug's been pulled out from under them. Yeah, including, including federal authorities that, uh, you know, may or may not give us the money we hope to get from them, like rail. Um, you know, it, it strikes me that when you have this kind of obstacle, when you have the, this kind of machination and risk, um, you know, you are actually sidelining a lot of developers who might enter the field but are not willing to do it. They're not willing to deal with government because they've been scared off. Furthermore, as I've said before on this and other programs, we need young developers. We need developers who are who are local developers. Um, we, need, we need to bring in a whole generation of developers to develop the state. And we have to invite them in and promise them a fair, a fair game. And we're not doing that. We're doing just the opposite. So I'm very concerned about it. And finally, and this is my last point and question to you, um, when we have a failed project, and we have many big failed projects, you and I have talked about some of them here. You've raised some very good examples. But when you have a failed project, who loses? It's the taxpayers. That's why the Tax Foundation of Hawaii is interested in the subject, right? Of course. That's, yeah. that's why we're talking about this today. Um, this is an aspect of public finance. This is one way government can or might, or might not get things done. Uh, and, it, and it uses taxpayer money. So we have to clear these things up if we want to develop the state. And developing the state is really critical at this point in time when we're at an inflection uh, and at risk of backwater. Well, thank you, Tom. Tom Yamachika, president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Thank you so much for appearing and co-hosting on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me on the show. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.